introduce Coach Martinez here uh, from Stepanak, who is here to uh, speak with me today and, and help me out. Um, <clears throat> just as Coach was saying, just very briefly, just want to tell you, uh, Fast has been around since uh, 1999. Coach both packets? Uh, both coach, yeah, but uh, the one on your left hand, uh, I don't know, there's maybe a couple, do like a dozen, maybe, okay. and not too many of those, just two or, two or three, because that's a long one, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Coach. Uh, I myself have been doing uh, strength and conditioning and been in the, the health and fitness field for 23 and a half years. This June will be 24 for me. Uh, we work with over a dozen teams presently. Um, our sort of top teams, if you will, uh, Mount Vernon basketball, as Coach said here at New Rochelle football. Uh, I own a prep football, and Coach Martinez, uh, like Coach DiRienzo, also uses our program over at, at Stepanak. Um, so we want to talk about in-season training. Just curious, how many guys, how many of you teams presently train lift weights in season? Just give me a quick show of hands. Is it just about everybody? All right, good. All right. So the purpose was today to um, speak to the coaches that – are currently lifting in season to see how we can help you, perhaps improve the program and answer any questions that you may have, make it more efficient and effective. For those of you that are not, to convince you that you need to be, um, since all of the teams that I mentioned are winning teams, to use as an example, and all lift year round. Basically, don't stop, okay? A uh, little background on the training methods first. Um, I always like to say none of these methods are our own. Fast, we didn't make these methods up. Everything that I'm reciting and regurgitating to you comes from the leading sports scientists in the world. Uh, I'm going to talk in particular about Westside Barbell, uh, Louis Simmons, and <clears throat> for example, this book of methods. I'll have the website and so forth. Um, other authors that I listed up here, down here at the bottom, Dr. Sif, Kurz, Thomas Kurz, Zatskiorski, Verko Chansky. So again, all I'm doing is quoting effective sports science, okay? stuff that's been tested, been proven on thousands of athletes. Okay? Um, oh, well, I'm going to just dispel a myth also. Most people, when they do hear about Westside, think it's just for power lifters. Not true. Okay? Completely not true. <clears throat> Excuse me. The reason why I say that is because, as I said, all of these methods essentially were taken by Westside from their old Soviet methods that were just popularized in the U.S. by Louis Simmons at Westside Barbell for powerlifters and then adapted for all sports. These methods actually come from track and field and Olympic weightlifting. And I know everybody in here is interested in their players getting stronger and faster, so what two better sports than track and field and Olympic weightlifting? Um, strength and speed, as I said, is the focus. Okay, so we want to talk a lot about how we're going to be able to not only maintain that in season, but continue to gain strength and speed as the season wears on. So as, as players typically as the season wears on and practices are accumulating and games are accumulating, uh, you might find fatigue, weariness, injury starting to set in. We want to do away with all of that. So as you guys are reaching the playoffs, hopefully you're, hopefully you're peaking and not on a decline, okay? So with that, something to keep in note. Uh, I know all of you guys uh, will tell your players in the off season, we need you to get stronger. We need you to get faster. You have to get stronger, you have to get faster. Most guys gotta gain weight. A few maybe have to lose weight, but probably less few. Most, you got, most of you guys want them to get bigger, you want them to get faster, you want them to get stronger. So you're telling them to lift weights all season, off season long, to get stronger, to get faster, and then August comes and we stop. Doesn't make sense. Because it's been proven the more highly skilled, trained, and conditioned an athlete is, the faster the rate of deconditioning. Okay? So if you stop lifting in season and doing some of the drills that you've been doing all summer long, then they're going to lose that very, very quickly. You want to maintain that, otherwise what was the point of doing it all off season, okay? Now, I know that with this, time is always of the essence, okay? In season, obviously we know you've got practice, you've got game films, you've got meetings, you've, kids got classes, etc. So time is always of the essence, and Coach Martinez is gonna talk in a few minutes about how 
to manage that, how he's been able to do it at Stepanak, obviously very effectively. Okay? So <clears throat> just a little bit uh, back again on the methods, because these methods continue all year. That's the point. I want to help you to see how the off-season program and the in-season program actually don't differ all that much as far as the actual exercises that we use, the methods that we use. So really the only thing is that sort of change is the volume of exercise, meaning how much time we're in the weight room. Obviously we're not in the weight room for 60 minutes in season. You don't have that time, okay? And also the intensity. And by the intensity, I'm not talking about your guys being all psyched up and rah-rah. I'm talking about the percentage. When I talk about intensity, I'm talking about the percentage of a one rep max. That's what I mean by intensity. So obviously the volume, the amount of time in the weight room changes the sets and reps a little bit less, and the intensity changes. But the methods, remember, remain the same. Okay? Um, so the methods that we use, I just want to give a little background, we use what's called the conjugate method of training, conjugate method of weight training, versus kind of the old school linear periodization. In the old school methods of linear periodization, what happens is you have different phases. So you have phase one, where you're building hypertrophy, you want guys to get bigger, so there's maybe some higher repetitions. Phase two, you go into a strength phase, okay? So the typical, the repetitions come down, the weights start to go up, and then you get into phase three, your power phase, where you start to use heavier weights with even lower repetitions. And these phases can last anywhere from two weeks to eight weeks, depending upon how you set your program up. But the point is, remember this. Okay, the stronger an athlete and the more well-conditioned, when you change phases and leave your hypertrophy phase to go into a strength phase or leave your strength phase to go into a power phase, within two weeks of switching phases, you've lost what your players gained in the first phase. Okay? What we're able to do with the conjugate method is all three of these phases work into what we call one microcycle, one week's workouts. Okay? We do all three phases within the setup, within the programming of one week, and in some cases, even within one workout. So we're able to maintain the gains that we've gotten all off-season, and even hopefully build upon them. Because ultimately, there is no such thing as maintenance. A lot of guys are lifted, oh, we've got to maintain the strength. No such thing. You either get, your athletes are either getting stronger, they're getting faster, or they're getting weaker. There's really no such thing as maintenance. Okay? There's no middle ground. It's one or the other. Okay? So we want to be able to continue to build upon what you guys did in the off-season right through the in-season in less time, okay? always keeping that in mind. Okay? Um, so with that, how do we do that? And again, Coach Martinez is going to get into this stuff. He's going to give you an example of the workout. He's going to give you an example of the schedule. I'm just talking right now about the methods and so forth. Okay? Oh, and one other thing, please ask any questions. I want to make this more informal and interactive, so if you have a question, don't hesitate to interrupt me, okay? Just stick your hand up and we can talk back and forth, okay? Um, for one, I want to talk about the max effort, okay? And explain off-season for one second. Max effort, building absolute strength, is the greatest method for training athletes. We max every single week, every week. And in fact, twice a week. Once upper body, once lower body. Now, right away people are always going to say, well, how is that possible? How do you do that? That's impossible. And the answer is by switching or rotating the exercises every week. So I'm not asking guys to bench press, bench press, bench press. Every week in the upper body, as an example, we might do a flat bench. We might bench to boards. We might do an incline, a decline, a military press. They rotate. And by rotating the exercises, we are able to max every single week and avoid what's called the law of accommodation. So if I had them bench press every week, they would accommodate to the exercise. Perhaps injuries start to develop in the shoulders from overuse. But by switching the exercises, we can max every week and help develop absolute strength. Okay? Now, remember I said that the max effort is the most important F, uh, method for athletes. How come? Central nervous system. When you guys practice at full speed, especially on Saturdays or Friday nights when you have games, a game is a max effort, obviously. You want 100, 110% out of your guys. Okay? 
That's a shock to the central nervous system, a stimulation to the central nervous system. When we max effort, what we're doing is not so much training the muscle system as much as the nervous system's ability to recruit the maximum number of muscle fibers that we need to do a lift or participate in our sport. Okay? And remember that by rotating exercises, we're able to do that because every stimulation to the central nervous system each week is different than the previous week. Okay? Questions on that? That's an important one. Okay, the other methods I'll just go through real quick and I can talk more about max effort afterwards if anybody has any questions. Dynamic efforts, essentially the, uh, I'll call it the opposite just to put it in simple terms. This is where we're using submax weights and trying to develop a high rate of force development. Okay, so we're using lighter weights, submaximum weights and trying to move them as fast as possible. Repetition method, high reps are trying to build mass, hypertrophy. Football players need to be bigger than most athletes that are walking around your schools. And explosive power is, uh, I'd love to be able to talk just on explosive power. We don't have all that time. Uh, but explosive power essentially is plyometrics. Explosive power is jumping, it's plyometric push-ups, and these types of things. Olympic weightlifting, fellas, is not explosive power. Okay, I don't have time to go into full detail about that. We can talk about that if anybody has any questions afterwards. But explosive power training, plyometric training, is jumping. And we do that in season as well. Massive emphasis on the posterior chain. Okay? Your athletes for blocking and tackling need to have strong low back, glutes, hamstrings. You see a lot, it, when you put the focus on them, and at Stepanak, I just finished my six years, the strength and conditioning coordinator, offensive line coach. Um, we focus a lot, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on the lower back, hamstrings and glutes, increase their speed, but also decrease a lot of hamstring injuries you see. Because a lot of people in their methodology, they train focusedly on the hips and the, and the quads. So they lose, the uh, they lose the strength in the hamstrings. As you find out, if you are imbalanced, you'll see some injuries in there. <clears throat> Since my la over my last six years, we have not had a severe hamstring injury at all because we focus on the low back, glutes and hamstrings to increase our speed and also to increase you know, our strength numbers because they will help out in strength gains because people uh, very forget to train that part. You know, they forget to train the posterior chain. So you know, I do a great job of focusing in on making sure those muscles are targeted every day throughout our strength campaign, you know, all the way up until you know, we're done. Uh, I, and I hit I left out a couple of things here. I mean, obviously the abdominals are very important. We train the abs every single workout. By the abdominals, I'm not just talking about the front, but all of the muscles of the, the rib cage, okay? And when we talk about our core, that being the popular word, uh, remember the low back is really, it's still part of the core, okay? So abs are important, and obviously we do a lot of neck work and a lot of shrugging trap work, try to build up the, build up the traps, protect the neck, concussions, obviously, uh, that should also could also be on here, and this stuff continues year round. Um, so exercises that we use, um, as I said, there's a ton of exercises. <clears throat> the conjugate method, just back here for a second, when we put all of these phases into one microcycle, we're constantly rotating the exercises. So the types of exercises that I'm talking about here are changing every week, but we do a ton of good mornings. Anybody doing good mornings still? It's an old, old exercise that a lot of people got away from because of the, oh, it's a dangerous exercise. Uh, kids are gonna hurt their lower backs. They're not gonna get hurt if you teach the technique correctly. It's all about the technique. There, there, weightlifting is not dangerous. Nobody's gonna get hurt in the weight room unless their technique is poor. So it's up to you guys or your strength coaches, whoever's doing that, to teach the right technique. We do a lot of good mornings, uh, both with bars and with bands. We can show you how to do those exercises. I think we have some bands. We can do some demonstrations if we need to. Um, we do a lot of variations on squats in season, okay? A lot of deadlifting. I didn't put uh, these exercises up, so I'm just talking about them. We squat and deadlift in season, okay? Remember, the volume changes and the intensity changes. So, back to max effort for one second. We're not doing a max effort squat in season. We're not doing a max effort deadlift in season as far as the classical lift is concerned, meaning, say, a deadlift from the floor or a squat 
back squat, okay, with no box. Uh, although I would note that really, I guess the, the, the number one strength coach in the country right now at Alabama, Cochran, uh, did have Derrick Henry squat 500 pounds in season, which was a max, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, three days before the Auburn game. So uh, just, just noting that. Um, but we don't, but what we do do is this thing that's called the lightened method, which means that we could take a kid up as high as 90, 95% of his max. So say if you squat, say if you have a 400 pound squatter and you're using bands, the lightened method, we attach bands from the top of a power rack onto the bar so that the bar is lighter. So it's 90 to 95 pounds, excuse, sorry, 90 to 95 of his max at the top when he stands up. But when he squats, there's a deload. Okay, so maybe he only has two, 250 pounds, depending on the type of band that you're using at the bottom. What this does is it allows him to still come close to a max effort, still stimulate that central nervous system, still develop absolute strength or max strength in season. Thanks, Coach. Uh, without putting a true 100% load of iron on his back during the season. Because we do want to make sure that we're recovering in between games Saturday to Saturday, obviously. So the lightened method is one of the methods that we use to bring uh, close to a max effort and we can still do deadlifts and we can still do squats in season, okay? Um, other pieces of equipment, I just want to note, I got the handouts here, I think I gave them to some of you guys. If you didn't, please take the belt squat machine, reverse hyper, and inverse curl. These three pieces of equipment we live on year round, especially in season. The belt squat in particular, because the belt squat does, allows us to squat, it allows us to develop, continue to develop the hips, the hamstrings, the posterior chain without loading the spine. Okay? So if you have a kid that's a little bit banged up, okay, and you don't want to load his spine, maybe he's a real physical player, okay, uh, the belt squat allows you to do all of these things without having to put a barbell on your back. Good mornings, all of these RDLs without having to put a barbell on your back and load the spine. So we're still getting stronger, we're still getting faster in season by use of a belt squat without loading the spine. Okay? The reverse hyper actually acts as a prehab and rehab exercise. Okay? So a lot of compression in football with contact. When you use a reverse hyper, okay, is anybody familiar with this? Reverse hyper, some of you, not many, okay. I'm going to hand these out so that we can, Coach, we just sure. start those and pass them back for me. <clears throat> um, the, re the reverse hyper will, again, continue to strengthen low back, glutes, hamstrings, as well as traction the spine so that we are working in a prehab, rehab manner in season as well. And the inverse curl. The inverse curl, the beauty of this is you guys want your players to run faster. Speed is obviously the name of the game today at virtually any position, okay, including with pulling linemen. Speed is hamstrings, guys. Okay? You've got to develop the hamstrings. As Coach Martinez was said, we don't really put much emphasis on developing quads other than squats and so forth. We don't do leg extensions, but we do a ton of hamstrings. Banded hamstrings, inverse curl primarily. The beauty of the inverse curl is you could put your 250 pound lineman, 300 pound lineman, if you have them in high school, you can put them on an inverse curl. It actually, when you put the weights on the machine, it is a counterbalance. So that most kids today, even the lighter skill guys, cannot do a correct glute ham raise. Okay, with correct technique. But by using the inverse curl, every repetition you perform, because of the deload of the inverse curl, you can do a perfect glute ham raise on an inverse curl and develop the hamstring so that you're developing speed throughout the season. Okay? These are just some of the uh, exercises and machines that we use. Okay? Now, if you don't have these three pieces, belt squat, reverse hyper, inverse curl, obviously there are a ton of other exercises that you could do. Okay, that we could talk about. Some of them I talked to you about good mornings, RDLs with dumbbells, barbells, banded leg curls, etc. Okay? All right. Um, if you want to just take a look at those, any questions on this for the moment? Yes? Are you, are you using, like, uh, like, how do you start with the amount of reps and the, because they're constantly changing? 
It's constantly changing. Okay, it's a good good question. And remember, what we what I'm hopefully I'm, I'm getting across if I'm, I'm telling it correctly is what we do in the off season or what we begin now in January, let's say, carries forward into a yearly plan. Okay, it's a yearly plan. So it carries forward as Coach Martinez is going to show you in a moment here into camp in August and then throughout the rest of the season. Okay, as he has his summer camp schedule and we have an example of one workout here. So everything carries forward. So that when he starts to explain, let's say, for example, on a Romanian deadlift, an RDL, 70%. You've already established what that 70% is because you've done an RDL max through the summer, so we have that number. Okay. So then we're able to set the sets and repetitions based upon that because everything's been established in the off-season. Okay. How do, you, how do you start out with to the younger guys? Like, how do you get oh, that one rep max? What you do, and um, it, it's kind of what I start is I work on waves. I do a five rep max wave, and then we kind of scale it down. Five rep, on week one, we'll do a five rep max. Then we'll come back, week two, three rep max. And week three, we'll do a two rep max. So that those younger guys by week four, we've already coached them up and they kind of have an idea. We're not going to one rep max those young guys right off the bat. We'll kind of gradually grab, you know, graduate them in to maybe week four, week five. We're looking at a one, they'll know and we'll get a one rep max number. From Thanks, Coach. Did I answer your question, Coach? You know, it's, now you look at it, it's commitment. You know, you look at off season, we all as football coaches, you know, talk about, you know, got to get in the weight room, got to get in the weight room, got to get in the weight room, you know, get faster, get stronger, go, go, go. Now we get into the summer, you know, same idea. Now we're getting into practice. You know, what do we do? Because we're so committed on our craft of getting our kids ready to go, ready to play, ready to, you know, be successful in the season. This is where you have to have a conversation with your staff. You know, I am lucky. I might, you know, I work for one of the best head coaches around, Coach Michael O'Donnell. And when I came aboard six years ago as the offensive line strength and conditioning coordinator, you know, we had a conversation about how do we get to that next level? How do we take our program to that next level? And in our staff meetings, we said, well, we need to lift. We need to do what we're doing in the off season, and we need to continue it. So we said, how? We need to have time, and we need to start budgeting time in our camp schedule in the summer and in our in-season schedule, you know, during our season to make sure that we're lifting, and we're lifting successfully. It's not going in there, you know, you tell your kids, go lift. You know, we all know they go lift because we've got, you know, what are we installing? You know, what are we going to cover in practice? And we just say, guys, go lift. And they go in there and they just do a couple of sets, go around, have some water, talk around, go back, do another set. So we made it as a staff. We said we need to get in there. We need to get after. How do we do that and fit it in our deck? Well, in camp, okay, we come in, okay? Our kids come in day one. They come in at 8 o'clock, anywhere from 8 to 8.30. We tell them, you've got to show up by 8.30. So they come in. At 8.20, you know, we do roll call. All right? We take attendance. If there's any, you know, things we need to communicate with our kids, that's the time we do it. 8.30 to 8.40, or actually for, for an hour, like 8.30 to 9.30, we go out in the field. We do sprints. Um... We do what we call metabolic training. We do conditioning circuits. We push the sled. We flip the tire. You know, we do bounds. We do all that stuff. So we got an hour in there, you know, that we could get it done. We come back. We go on break. You know, kids get a chance to go eat breakfast. Us coaches can sit and talk about what is the plan ahead. And from 9 or from 10 to 11, okay, we split it up. Okay, our linemen, Owen D linemen are one group. Our skills are another group. So what we do is from 9.30, or excuse me, from 10 o'clock to 10.30, one group will go lift in the weight room. We get in there, we monitor them, make sure they're getting after it, while the other group is meeting, installing that day. Whatever we're putting in that day, that's what we're doing. So we're in there for about 30, 45 minutes, then we switch. 
Okay, so then whoever's in the meeting gets a lift in, whoever's in the lift goes to meeting and install. Okay, then we come back, all right, we're done our meetings, we go to practice, okay, we take a break for lunch, we come back, have some more meetings, we practice again, that's the deck. All right, that's our camp deck. That's day one from camp until the end of camp when we're getting ready for our first game. Nothing really changes. We look at our, now, we look at our in-season, okay? We're in game mode, we call it game week mode. We'll lift twice a week, okay, twice a week, just like how many people lift at least once to twice a week? Okay, usually it's a Monday, definitely Monday, because we all have Saturday games. We usually lift Monday, and the next thing we lift is a Wednesday. The way we scheduled it out, and, and you guys, when you look at it, is the availability of your coaches. Not every coach works in the building. Not every coach, you know, can get there on time. So how can I use that to help this work? Well, what we do is Monday, you know, we do a team lift, or excuse me, we have a meeting after school, then we watch film and lift, okay, just like we did in the off season. Okay, we'll flip them. All right, one group lifts, one group watches film, then we switch. Then we'll, you know, go outside, have, you know, that typical, pro typical Monday practice, and then the day's over. Our Wednesday, because some of our coaches cannot make it there every single day, you know, after school, our team lift is after school. It gives your coaches who may not be able to get in the building, all right, that chance, you know, maybe that hour or two hour window to get there, to get there on time. So we build that in. Okay, so we come in on a, you know, usually it's a Wednesday, you know, we'll get right after school and the whole team will lift. We'll bring everybody in the weight room and we'll get after it. All right, and we're looking at only, you know, at the most 45 minutes. That's all we have budget. But we made a commitment as a staff to use the weight room to be successful. That's how we get there over our six years, you know, since I started in 2010 to where we ended up this year. You know, we've really changed the culture of the program. The program lives and dies in the weight room. And you ask any of our kids, and they look forward to it. If I have to close it for some strange reason, they're ready to, you know, kill me because they want to get after it. They want to get better because they know what you do in the weight room translates to what happens on the field. You know, we are successful because we can walk out there and know that we get it done. Now, what happens in the weight room? Okay, so I got, I got these, these, you know, 30 to 45 minute segments, you know, whether it's in camp or in season. Well, you know, first thing we do is some type of, they come in, they know right away. First thing you do is ask. Okay, I write these workouts on the board. If you have a board, just write them out. If you give out sheets, give out sheets. I've done it both ways. Okay, make them be accountable. Great way to make them be accountable is, you know, print out your workout, Give them sheets, make them write their name on it, make them fill it out. Because we all know kids in season, they don't want to lift. They don't want to do anything. But if you make them write it out, well, you're, you're holding them accountable. You know, and that's, that's the big thing. The weight room in the, in the preseason and in the in season is all about being accountable. Okay? So they know right off the bat they're doing 200 reps of abs. Then, you know, sometimes we have some what, we call, what I call prehab exercises. Whether it's, you know, like Coach Pete talked about, you know, the hyperextension at the beginning, where we're using submaximal weight to really get our bodies, you know, prepared for what's happening. You know, I like to do a lot of single leg exercises, you know, stimulate, you know, the neuromuscular system and stuff like that. And it's just real quick. It's not, I don't have time. You know, if you look at our off-season lifting, it's a whole lot more detailed than our in-season. Then we go right in the back squat, Okay. Just like we talked about, I'm not looking to get that one rep max, but I'm looking to get them to work and maintain what they have. So we'll do what we call a five rep heavy effort, you know, where they're attacking the bar for five reps. Then we'll come back and do some type of Romanian deadlift, you know, six sets of three. I'm not trying to get by, you know, I'm not trying to push them to their limits. I'm trying to maintain that. Okay, so when we step on the field, we start August 21st. I want them to be the same all the way up until we went to Buffalo. We were training that, you know, that Wednesday before Thanksgiving. When we went up to state championship, we're getting in there and still lifting. We didn't, we didn't skip a beat. 
You know, we played our championship game against Hayes. Monday we're lifting, and Wednesday we're in the gym. It doesn't change. So you look at it right up until we were playing our championship game, we were still doing this type of stuff. You know, we go to hyperextension, strengthen our lower back. You know, we'll do three sets of 15, working on that hypertrophy phase. You know, single leg step ups, half your body weight. You know, just stuff to get them going, get them accountable, you know, and maintain it. And they'll see it. You know, because at the end of the day, you know what this helps? This is all about? Fourth quarter. Fourth quarter. Are you still stronger? And do you still have the ability to keep going after? Okay, because in the fourth quarter, if you don't, you do great, and then you start slowing down. You know, we wanted to be the opposite. In the fourth quarter, we wanted to keep going. And there's nothing, you know, you look at our kids' eyes and they start understanding, you know, in that fourth quarter when those two and three yard gains turn into five, six, seven, ten, we start moving the ball, we can end games because of what we've done in the weight room. And it's great for the kids because they get proud. They love it. They love it. Coach, anything else? Coach, any questions? Just yeah. And I've been doing this a while, but could you just go over the difference between a Romanian deadlift and a stiff-legged deadlift? Uh, uh, there really isn't one. They're okay. essentially the same exercise with just different language. Um, we don't really do a stiff-legged deadlift. The correct technique of an RDL slash stiff-legged deadlift is with a slightly bent knee. So it's an RDL. Uh, the main thing, though, is to make sure that the hips are being pushed back. You're not bending over so that there's a curl in the spine. You've got to push the hips back so that we're loading the glutes and hamstrings. I That's teach the them idea. butt to the wall. Yep. So if, if I'm standing up, I'm not bending over at the hips. I'm telling them, take your butt and touch the wall. So as my butt drives back, my back stays straight, and I'm, I feel it right now. And I have nothing, no weight on me. I feel it right in my glutes and my hamstrings. And I'm really loading them so when I come through, I'm teaching them to squeeze at the top. So it's, it's not, I just teach them when I say, they say, is it a stiff leg? I go, no, it's unlock your knees. You know, just stand tall and just slight bend, butt to the wall, keep that back flat. As soon as you feel it in your hamstrings, drive through, squeeze your butt at the top. So th this is obviously an example of a lower body workout, which I think is important to note also that, yeah, that you guys are running a lot in season, obviously in games, et cetera, but... As Coach said, the way that we maintain increased strength going into the fourth quarter and conditioning is by actually exercising the legs with weights in season. Okay, so this is an in-season lower body workout. Rope pull-throughs, for those that aren't familiar, it's another hip exercise. This is actually these abdominals and rope pull-throughs are the warm-up. These rope pull-throughs are, are for the hips and the glutes. Okay, then what will happen though uh, next week is that this lower body workout will not look the same. It will change. Okay, so for example, this back squat may turn into a front squat, just to give you an example. Or a deadlift. Okay, or a deadlift. Okay. This Romanian deadlift may be there, but the percentage might change from 70% to 75% still at six sets of three. Okay, because we use three week waves. I don't want to get into too many details. But uh, Coach Martinez did not make up six sets of three. Just so you know, at 70%, we use something I suggest all of you look up if you're doing this stuff on your own, Prilipin's chart, okay? 